th thank you very much, Brady. This is actually my, my third Ignite. My first one was in New York City back in 2008. Um, it's a great series. So, yeah, I'm going to talk to you a bit tonight about some work I've been doing with some friends to help people with cerebral palsy use computers. So, first of all, what is this thing called cerebral palsy? If you hold your hand out in front of you and you contract your fingers together, imagine being unable to let go. That symptom, the inability to selectively decontract your muscles, is the major symptom of cerebral palsy. More than, ha more than half a million people in America have this disease. In fact, it's around 0.5% of the population. Put differently, in a theater the size of King Cat, it works out to be greater than 97% odds that somebody in the audience will have this if it was sampled randomly from the, the global population. Um, but tomorrow's economics will succeed where today's have failed because even though more than half a million people in the United States have this, um, if, you, if you could imagine a product targeted to 10% of that market, you'd still only sell about 50 or 60,000 units. So they have to sell in hundreds or thousands of dollars, which is unfortunate. But my name is David Albrecht, and I'm a hardware hacker. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you why the combination of contract manufacturing, internet distribution, and open source software is changing things. So I received this email from my friend Mike back in October. He's a med student. And uh, there was a design competition going on at Duke University that we decided to field an entry to. Um, the idea was that we were going to create this device that would help people with cerebral palsy use computers. And so um, the, the contest was sponsored by the Spastic Center Kanpur, which is an Indian organization. It's based in Uttar Pradesh. And it, it's an organization created to help the parents of children with spastic disorders um, cope and provide them with guidance strategies. So, of course, I'm not a doctor, so I have no idea what this means. <laughs> and they said that you know, only the computer people are the jargon, jargonistas. But um, I went to the Seattle Public Library and did some original research on this. And what I discovered was uh, it's actually an entire class of disorders that affect people in a lot of different ways. So on this chart, you can see there's, there's at least three different types. Um, we're focusing on spastic because more than 80% of the cases fall into that bin. There's also athetoid and ataxic. And strangely enough, even though those are less common, those ones are considered more like treatable or more therapeutically addressable. The other thing I learned was that um, there's, even within spastic, there's a lot of different ways that it can affect people. Um, there's obviously like hemiplegic and diplegic and quadriplegic cases. So the take home point from all this was that we realized the device would have to be reconfigurable. Um, you couldn't just make one for everybody. In addition, it has to be easy to set up so that if, even if you're not a computer person, you'd be able to use this thing. And cost is important because we'd like to make it available to people in India and of the United States of relatively modest means. So this is the outline of our design. Um, you can see there's some switches on the left, and those are positioned at various points on a person's body. They can be moved around depending on the nature of the, the way in which a person's affected. And then in the middle, you can see there's a USB human interface device, which most of us would call a keyboard, but it just defines the way it talks to the computer. So it works over USB. So we had this discussion with ease of setup versus ease of use. And ideally, you'd like to create a device where you could, it could be easy to use initially, but as a user would progress and become more comfortable with it, they wouldn't have to sacrifice some of the usability, like being able to type more quickly. So this shows the design on a breadboard. This is actually taken on my desk. And you can see there's a USB port above the breadboard. And if you push that little green button on the left, it's kind of cool. It actually sent an M to the computer. So I'm sitting there on Gchat and my friends like, hey, look, I just typed this character M. So that's kind of neat. But um, <laughs> we had a big reduction in NRE. That's non-recurring engineering cost, which is the cost of designing something. Because I was able to get this to work using an existing open source code base called HidKeys. So by doing that, we, were, we just eliminated the design cost. And I think that we can sell this thing pretty cheaply if we're able to get it mass produced. So the next question is, all right, you know, will we be able to do that? Um, this board actually shipped from China today using a service called Batch PCB. I was able to get it fabricated for only $8, which is pretty cheap. Um, it's three and a half square inches, and they charge about two fifty dollars per square inch. So after I get the board, I'm going to have it sent to my house. And I'm going to discuss with my friends. We might explore cording, which is the potential of having multiple switches pushable at the same time. And also, uh, you know, talk about some macros. So maybe if there's only five or six of these switches, the thing can support 17. We could just fire off some macros. Um, I'd like to close with two personal notes. This has been a pretty dense talk, I know. <laughs> the first is, I think that a lot of interesting problems through the next decade are going to require a little bit of hardware mixed with a little bit of software. But it's amazing what you can do if you stick your toe a little bit in. Um, in energy and healthcare and transit, there's a lot of great problems that are only going to be open if you do a little bit of hardware. The second is that it is so much fun to do this stuff. My God. Like, I started in 2000, 2001, you can see here, and I'm standing with my friends on some speakers that we built in uh, someone's garage. So, you know, if you're just sitting around and one day you want to do a project, it's, it's a really great use of time. You can learn a lot, and you can do a lot of just fun. So it's good. Uh, this is my contact information, and if you want to get involved with the project or, you know, if you need some hardware cut, 
Want to just talk shop? Give me an email. Thanks.